Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Education Day. It's great to see everybody. I'm Laura Zakowski, Vice Chair for Education, and very happy to see everybody here as we celebrate on Education Day. Great scholarship, mentors, educators, all sorts of people who support education in our Department of Medicine. And if you haven't registered for the day's activities today, you definitely can. There's a schedule, a paper schedule outside the room, and all you would have to do is say, yes, I want to be here for the day. We'd be glad to have you. And if you have registered, using the QR code on the schedule is where you can check in if you wish to. Unfortunately, Dr. Lynn Schnapp wasn't able to be with us today. She is at another meeting where all the Department of Medicine chairs are talking together along with other leaders. I know she would be very happy to be here and celebrate with us both in awards and also faculty development. So this morning we'll start with Grand Rounds and immediately after that our uh, post Grand Rounds discussion with Dr. Abraham, our speaker today. And then we will honor the education awards immediately after that. So if you can stay after Grand Rounds, that's great. We'd love to have everybody and honor those who have been nominated for their excellence in our department. All right, I'll introduce Dr. Abraham. Welcome to UW. Dr. Abraham is Associate Professor and Associate Vice Chair of Undergraduate Medical Education at UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. She completed residency at Albert Einstein Montefiore in the Bronx and then her, and her medical school at Texas Tech University. Dr. Abraham has an important national presence at many of the education groups and conferences that determine policy for our students and trainees including at the American Association of Medical Colleges, and also importantly at the Clerkship Directors and Internal Medicine Organization, where she has been a recent president and also a council member. She's been a key force in designing the new structured letter of evaluation for students applying for internal medicine residency. Dr. Abraham successfully teaches at the faculty, trainee, and student level. In her current position, she works on improving residency advising, standardizing grading and assessment across UME clinical experiences. And she mentors course directors and clerkship directors and is leading the student and faculty teaching awards program. Wow, you're doing an awful lot. <laughs> <laughs> Including all of that, she has some recent publications that are very pertinent to what we're talking about today. Rethinking the IM residency application process and also preference signaling for the residency match and how clerkship characteristics and subject exams determine step two USMLE exam results. And she's received numerous awards and two recent awards were that she was inducted into the Kenneth I. Shine Academy of Health Science Education as a distinguished teaching professor and the University of Texas Regents Outstanding Teaching Award. Thank you for being with us today. <laughs> I think that's the best introduction I've ever had. I'm just going <laughs> to bring you with me. Um, uh, yeah, it, it is fascinating because when you say all of that work, I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't even realize I'm doing that because honestly, it's so much fun and it's such important work. And I work with such wonderful people in the same spaces who are working towards that same goal. So you're never doing it by yourself either. Um, so yeah, it's wonderful. And, and even just the little bit of time I've been here, it has been so wonderful to meet people that are working in this space and hearing all of the work that you all are doing. Um, and I'm honored to have been invited here. I have to say, I've always been inspired by people from the University of Wisconsin, everybody I've met from here and my national work and um, around conferences has been amazing. So the fact that I got invited, I was really excited. So thank you so much for, for bringing me. And I know some of this stuff um, I know that you all talk about, so I'm excited to also talk about how we can mitigate bias in evaluations and letters, and we'll, we'll talk about the evidence too. But business matters first. You all need to get credit for being here. You showed up bright and early, um, so you can text this phone number, and there's the code for you all. Give that a second. And then here are all the disclaimers. There's a lot of disclaimers <laughs> I have to share. So I want to make sure you see all of them. <clears throat> but to make the learning objectives, 
um, and really focus on them. Um, so by the end of this talk, we will have examined a lot of evidence of racial and gender bias in evaluations and letters. And then also, you know, while we're talking about identify areas of personal implicit bias where this may affect us, um, real, realizing that bias is everywhere and it affects everyone. And then we wanna talk about how we can implement intentional systems to mitigate bias when observing learners in real time? And then how do we develop strategies in documenting those observations of learners or peers and letters and evaluations? So I first wanna talk about our educational ecosystem, right? It is quite complex. It can be beautiful, a lot going on. Um, and with this system that we experience, we're, we're bringing our own past experiences as learners, what we have seen role modeled in this system, and maybe what we have set out ourselves to learn on various topics. So I feel like this cartoon illustrates our interactions with components of this ecosystem. So here in this cartoon, you have the school teacher fish talking to the student fish Good morning kids, how's the water? These fish go along and they look a little baffled and they're like, what, what, what is water? <laughs> right? we, we don't always recognize the importance of uh, different components of the system that we directly interact with and how it may affect everything that we do. So unconscious bias affects each and every one of us. And so we're gonna talk about a lot of evidence on bias and evaluations and grading, honor society selection, letters of recommendation. And so if you personally are looking for ways to identify potential implicit bias in yourself, I really highly recommend the Harvard Implicit Association tool. Um, there are a lot of different tests. They talk about um, obesity, gender, career, race, presidents and preferences for, for different types of um, uh, populations. So I highly recommend it. There were, I, you know, if you did the pre-work, that's great. Or you may have done it multiple times before with other conferences. So I really think it's great. <clears throat> but most of us have patterned our behavior or learned from what we experienced in our own lives. So I want to first talk about the data of our own medical learning environment in our own academic medical centers. So this is a very, you know, you know, uh, two-dimensional cartoon. I know I not, not all men wear bow ties and not all women wear dresses, but it's for, it's for the, uh, the effect. Um, so let's look at our medical learning environment. So when we're looking at um, our academic centers and who is going into medical school in general, it's pretty even. We have 50% women, 50% men. However, when we look at our who is going into faculty at academic medical centers, it starts to shift where there are 60% men and 40% women. But when we look at who is in senior leadership at these academic medical centers, as well as the boards, the medical boards, it gets a lot smaller. So 15% women. So what about medical school grades? What about evaluations? What do we know about gender and performance in underrepresented um, in medicine uh, learners? So we do know that female gender has been associated with higher empathy and interpersonal scores, also better clinical performance and higher medical school grades. On the other hand, underrepresented in medicine learners have been associated with less likely receiving a higher clerkship grade. And when we look at honor society selection, so our institution does have an alpha mega alpha and we do have a GHHS, so it's important to look at the data. And we do find that membership for white students is nearly six times that for black students and nearly two times greater than for Asian students. So what about the things that we write? What about those narratives? Those are, a lot, those are a lot about scores, right? So we do find that narrative bias pops up in a lot of different ways. So some of it is um, use of adjectives. 
maybe doubt raising language. So how we may frame uh, uh, a skill or performance. References to personal life, even appearance. We'll see some of this in the data. Um, references to accomplishments. And then the length of evaluations or letters can be different for different populations. So this is a really um, important study. Um, and it was done by Rojek et al. And it looked at the differences in um, lit narrative language that was used depending on if you were a man or a woman and depending on your grade of a pass or an honors. And they found that there were 37 words that were used differently between men and women. 62% of these descriptors talked about personal attributes as opposed to competency. And 57% of those personal attributes were more often used in evaluations of women. So we were describing women more in personal attributes. Um, when you look at what was related to the pass or honor, so you'll see passes there at the bottom of the graph and honors at the top. Um, and they use pink and blue for men. I hate the color pink for women, but that's just me. <laughs> that's the color they decided to use. Um, and for women, they saw that the use of the word pleasant was more associated with past grades, whereas the use of the words wonderful and fabulous, which, right, that's definitely honors, is associated more with an honors grade. For men, good, which, you know, who, who doesn't want to be good? But that was associated with a past grade, whereas humble, was more likely to be associated with an honors grade or great. <clears throat> so they also looked at underrepresented in medicine versus not underrepresented in medicine learners. And here they found 53 descriptors that were used differently between the two. 30% of those were related to personal attributes with 81% that were used more often to describe non-underrepresented in medicine students, which I think is really fascinating. 28% were only competency-related descriptors, and 100% of these were used more in evaluations of non-underrepresented in medicine students. So what about different letters of recommendations? Are there narrative language differences? And I think this is important to put at the beginning because we need to have a, a lexicon, like what, are, what words are we looking for? How are these um, sometimes categorized in the literature? And so here, this was a study that looked at orthopedic um, residency letters of recommendation. Um, it actually looked at traditional versus a standardized template. So we'll first talk about the traditional template and then we'll talk about the data for standardized later. But they found, you know, they basically categorized words into these five different uh, components. So agentic, communal, grindstone, ability, and standout. And the asterisks just mean that they used any type, any form of that word. So it could be the adjective, the adverb, or, or any ending. So, um, so there was, what the data showed was that standout terms were used more often for white applicants as well as male applicants. And grindstone terms were used more often for underrepresented in medicine applicants. Now, this isn't to say that we shouldn't be using these terms of standout or, or some grindstone words to uh, explain. Program directors want all those details, Dr. Coyle can tell us. Um, and they want those details on non-cognitive qualifications, but that's really important in being a professional. It's really important in being a physician, but we have to be really careful to make sure that we are applying this language equally, as well as rooting it in evidence. So let's look at surgery letters of recommend, um, recommendation. They too also found these are all, most of these are single institutional studies. So this was a single institution and it looked at um, the narrative language differences for their um, applicants into their surgery residency program. Um, for male applicants, they found that there were more references to ability, achievement, award, leadership and scholarship and superlatives were more frequently found for female applicants, they found that there were more references to work ethic, 
more of those grindstone adjectives, more doubt raising language. So an example of a doubt raising um, a phrase or would be, um, you know, with uh, coaching, this learner would be able to succeed in your program. So that lay a little bit of a flag. Also more comments on physical description. Um, a, a common example would be referencing their smile. Um, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, that's, that's the uncomfortable laugh, right? <laughs> right? Um, and then positive, but general comments, like talking about someone being delightful or enthusiastic. And so you'll see on this table to the right, um, there are more uh, comments on male applicants being maybe the best, having leadership, whereas female applicants are more talking about care in the team, also words known as communal terms. So what about in neurology? And how does this maybe affect outcomes? So we talked about their differences. Does it matter? Does it matter in the end? So this study was a single institution study and they found again that the letters of recommendation for these urology applicants for men had more references to power, drive and work. And they found that those letters that were had more power words had a higher likelihood of matching. So there are differences in outcomes. So what about in radiology? So for radiology, they found that there were more agentic terms used to describe female applicants. And we looked before in the orthopedic literature and you know, some of those agentic terms, it could be ability or um, you know, um, uh, like a comp or skill. Uh, they could be aggressive is another agentic term. Um, so when they dug deeper to figure out like what were the differences that were driving this, they found that it was more the use of the words skill and dedication rather than words like dominance or tough that we'll be using. Um, they found that there were fewer agentic terms when describing underrepresented medicine or other applicants as compared with white or Asian applicants. So the MSPE. Right, everybody knows the medical schools have to write a medical school um, a performance evaluation. It's called an evaluation. Um, and they did this study where they looked at over 6,000 MSPEs to see if there were any narrative differences. And they found that white applicants were more likely to be described using standout or ability keywords, such as exceptional, best, and outstanding, and that black applicants were more likely to be described as competent. However, that was associated with doubt raising language or minimal assurance. Women were more likely to be dedicated as described as caring. We saw that right in the surgery LORs, compassionate and empathetic, also bright and organized. But they didn't find any uh, difference in these MSPEs of standout or grindstone adjectives for men versus women. So what is the structure of value to a letter? So Dr. Zakowski shared that I was lucky enough to chair the task force with Dr. Susan Lane um, that looked at the Department of Medicine summary letters when the pandemic broke out and we realized, oh my gosh, like this is gonna be um, really tough and we needed to give some guidance to our internal medicine colleagues on, on how to um, approach the residency application cycle. We also recognize it was a time to, you know, no, never let a crisis go to waste. So we thought, hey, this is a good time to look at the Department of Medicine summary letters. What's working? What's not? What's new in the literature? You know, what can we do to try to make this better? And so we looked and we, we learned a lot about structured evaluative letters and how it's different from a letter of recommendation. So these are the common principles. One is it's an evaluative instrument. Um, it does include a global assessment of candidacy for residency in that particular field. There is a standard set of questions and prompts and they are focused on specific competencies and values. There's a trend to avoid comparisons between applicants, but it all depends on the way the letter is structured. Um, and Really, they wanted to support efforts of promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion with structured letters. This was one of the 
um, recommendations by the COPA task force as well, the Coalition of Physician Accountability, is that letters should be written in this structured way. And that was the goal is to reduce bias by directing answers to these specific standardized questions. And then also limiting the variability that we find in the traditional letters of recommendation to support a more efficient and holistic review. And currently these structured letters exist for emergency medicine, who's been doing it the longest, internal medicine, OBGYN, and orthopedics. So some common key components of these structured letters is there is an introduction. This is the context. So how does the letter writer know the applicant? What, where is the data coming from that you're putting into this letter? Um, because we all know that the LCME tells us all to do everything the same. Just kidding. Um, and then what are the specifics of the rotations? What assessments are being included? How do people perform on these assessments? Contextual comments specific qualifications to that specialty, as well as an overall evaluation. So when we're talking about the qualifications and overall sections, there um, are different approaches to those sections and it could be norm reference versus criterion reference. And I talk about this because we'll talk about some evidence around norm referencing um, later. So norm reference is whenever you compare the applicant to peers or other learners. So examples or percentile uh, ranks on different testing. And this can be helpful to determining how a learner is developing when compared with other learners. Whereas criterion referenced is a performance compared against a standard benchmark. So for um, example, these can be the milestones in ACGME. Um, or a written portion of a driving test. And this is helpful to determine if a learner has mastered the material. An example in undergraduate medical education is the entrustable professional activities. So let's look at the evidence for different structured evaluative letters. They all call them different things because we all like to be special. <laughs> so for an orthopedics, they call theirs the standardized letter of recommendation or the SLOR. Um, and they looked at the, whether or not there were gender or race-based differences with these standardized or structured letters of recommendation. And they actually found that compared to the traditional letter of recommendation for orthopedics, that there was a decrease in um, differences. So they, um, as you can see though, the effect sizes are a little small, um, but there were um, decrease in these differences. So let's look at narrative comments in these structured evaluative letters. So ENT at one point had, um, a, they called their SLOR to a, a standardized letter of recommendation. Um, and they talked about, uh, when they did this review, they found that female applicants were described more with terms as team players. Also, they were less likely to have a letter of minimal assurance so that was better. Um, and they uh, compared their structured and standardized letters of recommendation to the traditional narrative letters. That's what the NLOR stands for. And they found that male applicants in the narrative letters were more likely to have reference to the leadership potential, but they didn't find that in the standardized. And that female applicants were less likely to be described as bright and more likely to have their appearance mentioned in the traditional letters. Now for emergency medicine, when they looked at their narrative differences, they found no difference in doubt raising language. There wasn't um, uh, one population that had more than the other, and there wasn't uh, a difference in standout terms. They called theirs the standardized letter of evaluation or SLOWE. They did find a difference with affiliation words and ability words for female applicants. So the emergency medicine has also done uh, some studies to see what about those normative rankings and their qualifications and their overall sections. And they did find that there was bias in these normative rankings. And they found in one study that underrepresented medicine uh, applicants had lower rankings when compared to non-underrepresented medicine in all three categories. So the global assessment, they have a question where they ask what's the predictive placement on their own institution's rank list, as well as the seven separate emergency medicine qualifications. Another study looked and they found that for global assessment, there were lower rankings for underrepresented medicine applicants. So similar to above, um, even after controlling for various factors, such as the step one score, MSP, class percentile, et cetera. For the rank list, 
they found that there were lower rankings for Black, Asian, and Hispanic applicants as compared to white. When they controlled for those various factors, they found no difference in Black and Hispanic applicants, although we could talk about score issues as populations, um, but it did remain for Asian applicants compared to white applicants. Okay, but internal medicine is better, right? Like we're, we're much better. <laughs> um, so looking at um, this study, looked at the internal medicine fellowship letters of recommendation to a cardiology fellowship. And this used the Alliance of Academic Internal Medicine recommended program director template compared to like the traditional narrative uh, format. And what they found that when you use the templated components of the Alliance uh, template, it did reduce communal language for underrepresented and cardiology applicants. And looking further, they uh, saw that they thought that was because it separated the core competency into six different sections, as well as separated out a personal characteristic section. They did find that when communal language was used, it was framed negative, negatively for underrepresented in cardiology and positively for non-underrepresented in cardiology. So their recommendation was that there needs to be a growth section for all letters and all applicants. So that again, we are applying this um, equally. They also found doubt raising language only in underrepresented in cardiology. And the things that increased bias were using those evaluative quotes and written narratives from their own um, evaluations at their own institution. So adherence to a recommended standardized template did reduce bias, but it did not completely eliminate it. So let's look at evaluations in residency. I think there are some residents here, so I'm sure this is gonna be really important for them to hear. So looking at this study in emergency medicine, they found that male and female residents began their PGY one year at similar evaluation scores. However, male residents attained higher milestone rankings at a higher rate. They found that these higher mean milestone scores for men continued until graduation and it was on all 23 sub competencies, so it's throughout. Um, and when they dug deeper into these evaluations, they found in these narratives that there was less specific feedback that was provided to female residents. So surgery, there was a scoping review and it reviewed all of the studies on gender and uh, racial bias. They found that the majority of studies focused on gender bias. There was actually only four studies within, within their review, and this was done last year, that uh, focused on underrepresented in medicine surgical trainees. So one of their calls to action, we need more, we need more research on this. They also found that the specialties were represented differently with most of the studies being general surgery and plastic surgery having a lot of literature on uh, bias in medicine, um, but there was none on neurosurgery. So really needing to pay attention to all the various uh, subtypes of specialties and making sure um, this is being uh, studied throughout. And reason we need to study it throughout is there are variable results depending on the context, the type of assessment and the institution. However, the review found that the majority of studies showed that women scored worse than men on standardized assessments self-assessments and evaluations. And all four studies found reported on underrepresented medicine surgical trainees found report of bias. So internal medicine evaluations. So studies have shown that women residents more often contained references regarding confidence. And this is really important because we know that there is a confidence gap with women and that women will rate themselves lower despite similar performance than men. Um, there's also an interesting study, it was a Billick et al, um, dis, dif, uh, where they did a qualitative study looking at gender differences in residents' experiences of feedback. And they found that those um, residents who received feedback on confidence or authority begin to change their persona to fit a certain type. So they dress differently, they put on the armor differently, they put on the costume differently to change to fit 
what people thought they should be. Um, some studies, one study found no difference in numerical ratings between men and women, which is wonderful, um, uh, but did find this change in, in regards to narrative, narrative evaluations that talked about confidence. Another study found that PGY1 and PGY2 underrepresented in medicine and Asian internal medicine residents received lower ratings than white residents. Um, however, this resolved by PGY3. And so some thought was that maybe this reflects initial racial bias and assessment that then after you longitudinally get to know someone evened out over time. So what about faculty, right? Like what about our evaluations? What is the evidence there? And, and it's really important to look at faculty evaluations because right, we talked about the promotion issues. We talked about leadership issues. And a lot of universities, I know ours, I don't know about you all, but they use faculty evaluation scores and comments in the promotion and tenure committee. And, you know, when you're an annual evaluation, we pull those up, like how good of a leader, should I think about this person for this leadership position? So if when you look at the narratives that are used in faculty evaluations, you'll find more ability terms for men, such as mastered the material, um, is a, a leader, um, can you know, manage complexity, um, and they're more emotive terms for women. So such words and terms like delight to work with, warm, um, art of medicine. There are also score variances, and so there are a lot of different studies. So in all the different studies, the scores of so teaching scores um, either varied from there were no differences to there were decreased scores for women. There are also very interesting um, concordance differences where there was one study at an institution that showed that if you were rated by a female trainee, your scores were lower. Either, and that it didn't uh, matter if you were a male or a female faculty. Um, another institution study showed, they looked at multi, um, multiple departments within their institution and they found that there were variances by different specialties. So they found actually in their study, internal medicine didn't have a difference in their score, but family medicine did um, as well as surgery. Okay, that was the sad part, <laughs> right? Now, now we're gonna talk about what we can do to mitigate this bias. The bias is there, right? It's there. Um, so how can we mitigate? And I'm excited to talk about a lot of the work that we've been doing at our own institution to really help um, mitigate bias. So I think we first need to recognize that assessing learners is quite complex. There are a lot of interacting factors. Um, and the first we need to, to realize our human nature, right? We um, tend to use our intuition. This is our, our type one thinking, right? It's our very quick thinking. It's our intuition. It's based on our general gestalt, but it's really important to dig deeper, to identify observations and why we perceive things in a certain way. And so a lot of those perceptions are because of our biases and how that may affect our judgment. So we need to think about affinity bias. So if someone is, is like me, like I say, I meet someone else who grew up in Southeast Texas, um, you know, then I have an automatic affinity. If I meet someone like Dr. Coyle who trained in New York, like me, I'm like, oh, we're so the same, uh, right? So you have that affinity bias. Um, there's also, you know, likability bias. Um, so, uh, you know, someone, you know, you like them and this is, I think, really important in performative environments, right? So in like medical school, medical uh, residency, all of these are very performative clinical learning environments. And those uh, personalities that tend towards extroversion tend to be rewarded. They tend to be rewarded in their likability, their affability. So it's really important to think about that when we're talking about um, uh, assessment. And then there's like the intersectionality, right? Where you may be in multiple marginalized groups and how that may affect um, uh, biases. So when thinking about the complexity of assessment, we have to think about frame of reference, right? There are people that are naturally maybe 
uh, more uh, severe scores or harsher scores and more lenient scores in that certain uh, nature. Sometimes that comes from their prior experiences and also maybe their own expertise in assessment. Um, we know there's a lot of halo effect that goes on the Lake Wobegon um, when it comes to evaluations. We also need to think there's the personal promotion concerns that we have when we're um, assessing learners and we're filling out these evaluations. And that's because it can be used in promotion and tenure. And so we're worried, what if I say something and how is that person going to take it? How is, is there going to be any reciprocity? What's going to happen to my own evaluations? Um, we, last night, we were also talking about how feedback is, is better given when you have a longitudinal relationship, like it's better received. But that, that can also make it hard to give feedback because then you worry, how am I going to change this relationship when I give this constructive feedback? And then we're concerned about our learner promotions. We just talked about all of this bias and how there is bias. And we're worried, like, what is this going to do to this learner's career um, if I you know, put a score that's lower? Um, and so then a lot of times we tend to fall back on these generalized or stereotypical phrases like keep being great, you know, continue to read. Um, so really generalized and stereotypical feedback that doesn't necessarily help in growth. So when thinking about how to mitigate bias on a personal level, I really like this uh, Stephen Covey quote that says, begin with the end in mind. And so my four steps are first, setting an intention. And we'll talk in depth about each of these. Two, keeping a notebook for observations on clinical skills and the learning environment. Three, document the behavior observed, not the judgment of the behavior. And that is hard. And four, use a standardized framework for evaluation documentation. So let's talk about step one, setting an intention. So for me personally, um, so I am a hospitalist, but I also work in a palliative care clinic and I do four um, inpatient ward teaching blocks a year. And so before my uh, ward blocks, I take out my calendar and I have the 14 days that I'm going to be on service. And I put the long calls and the short calls and I put all the meetings and I put everybody's day off. And then I look and I'm like, okay, this is the day that I'm going to observe somebody take an H and P. The, when I say I put, I'm going to observe, observe one to two people this day. I'm like, this is the day it's really good to um, observe physical exam skills. This is the day that we can do family meetings and we can like sit down because I have a good chunk of time. You need good chunks of time for that. So I really try to be intentional as well as like, oh, here are the days we're going to like do teaching. And these are the times we're going to do it. Part of that I also think creates some psychological safety of like, everybody knows this is the days we're gonna observe. So I'm not like, you know, gonna pop it on you and tell and surprise you. So that also is part of it. So I just try to be really intentional. I also try to be really intentional about icebreaker activities. Um, so trying to learn more about each team member. And I don't know how you, you guys schedule works, but for us, like, you know, someone's day off is their first day that I'm there taking on a service or the team changes halfway through. And like, when I'm like halfway through the service, I'm tired. And I'm like, I still have to be very intentional about doing those icebreaker activities so that I can learn more about um, the learners and, and help overcome some of that um, affinity or likability bias. So step two is writing down our documentation in real time. So I don't know how many of you watch um, true crime shows or love watching crime shows, right? I mean, we're, we're internists, the investigative part, right? Um, but I'm always fascinated at how unreliable eyewitness accounts are. And so to the left, you'll see, um, this is like a graphic from where they talked about eyewitness accounts and how the memory is affected by all of these different parts of our brain. And it's like the sensation that you're going through, the attention, how you consolidate it, how you store it, can you retain it? And then when you retrieve it, what, what are you um, doing to that memory? And so when they're looking at these eyewitness accounts and why they're unreliable, they found that you know, when it makes it 
more unreliable is when you have divided attention. So, I mean, talk about us assessing learners in a clinical learning environment. I mean, we're all doing five things at once in that situation. Um, the other importance is thinking again about our system one thinking, so our intuitive thought process versus our system two or our reasoning thought process. And it's really, our, our minds are really quick to consolidate that information with our int intuition. And it happens almost immediately. And that is where bias will come in. You add stress. Um, you add uh, writing those documented accounts weeks after, and that makes the details even more difficult. So documenting during an observation really helps lean on more of our system too. Really helps slow us down as well will help with that retention and help with those details. So step three, is being very specific or concrete. So this is where I like draw the parallel to soap notes, right? We all know soap notes, right? That's been like grilled into us um, from the beginning of our medical education. And so I really think about how documenting for our learners is like documenting a physical exam. It's like the objective portion of the note. And so when I think about the uh, physical exam, I think about the EPAs and I'm like, oh, it's just like, you know, general, you know, cardiac, um, yeah, so pulmonary. And so then really focusing on history taking, physical exam skills, oral presentations, and not the assessment, not interpreting those before we get to that assessment. I also like to keep a record of patients so that I can look that up later for documentation purposes. Maybe I didn't look at it that very same day, but I can look it up later. This is also how um, at UT Southwestern for our internal medicine clerkship, we have utilized evaluation conversations. And we have, there has been literature on an intervention called the structured free recall activity that really helps to reduce bias in performance evaluations. And they found this in multiple studies. And so we use that same, same objective script when talking to our supervisors, our evaluators, to make sure that they are talking about each one of these domains so that we can make sure everybody is talked about. And we'll talk a little bit about the framework that we use in those conversations. So how do you know what framework you want to use? Um, so there's, you know, you can choose your own framework, but make sure you're using the same framework or your program may choose a framework for you. Um, but for medical students and trustable physician activities, so I have a couple of, of uh, examples of comments. So when the first comment is when uh, observing someone perform a history and physical. So this comment from an evaluation says the learner was able to organize H and P based around problems and a differential list, but sometimes had trouble changing question based on what a patient told him. Uh, very specific to what they saw. Um, on then for this written uh, evaluation or evaluation on a written H and P or oral H and P on his last H and P presentation, this learner stuck to the SOAP format while telling a clear and thorough complex story of events leading to and prior to hospitalization, provided clinical reasoning for suggested management plan. So I'm guessing, you know, when someone reads this, they can tell what they did well. Also, I'm sure program directors, that would be great to be able to read that much detail on a learner. And then for residency, you can also use the milestones. So again, drawing parallels um, to the subjective and objective. Um, I want to talk about this comment at the level I would expect. So I think this is a very common thing that I've written as well as I read on evaluations. Now, after years of being a clerkship director, as well as a member of my clinical competency committee for residency, I have realized that, that people have different expectations. <laughs> so I realized that it doesn't actually tell me about the performance of the learner. It tells me more about the expectations of the evaluator. And so I'm still not sure quite 
what the learner is performing. But this is something I read all the time, right? When I was reading my own evaluation. So you think that's a great term to use. I'm going to use it too. So when documenting, I really think about the importance of the subjective and the objective. The subjective in this um, in this domain is really talking about the context of your observation and the backstory. So talking about, like say, I'll use my inpatient word experience again. So I, you have a couple of learners and one of your learners may have just luck of the draw got all the most difficult, challenging patients because that's just how the, the, the inpatients rolled in, right? Whereas you had another one that maybe took care of the bread and butter. So you're never going to equalize these experiences. It's just not going to happen. But the subjective can give context to it. And hopefully over a course of three years, this will have changed and people will have seen a variety of things. Could also talk about this is in a consult service. Maybe it was a busy consult service. Maybe you were um, in the ICU and everybody had COVID. So all of these things can be really helpful to painting some of that context and backstory. And the objective is what you saw. So again, report what you saw, no need to interpret. And this is very similar to physical exam or lab data. And I really think of the assessment and plan as the decision that needs to be made by administrators or committees, not the individual evaluator who's just seeing this small snippet in time. It is important to share early, but not necessarily making that assessment and plan. And so we try to talk to that to our faculty about this all the time. And I will say they find that freeing. They're like, whoo. Thank goodness, I don't want to be making that judgment. I don't want to be circling this, you know, because I don't know. I've only seen them for this this long. I'm not sure. And I'd rather someone who's seeing the full picture be able to make these decisions. But to be able to make these decisions, you need the observations. <clears throat> and so when thinking about ways to talk about next steps, right? We talked about we need growth for all our learners. Um, I like to use the point and describe method. So when you did X, I saw the patient do Y, um, or when you did X, I would have done Y. So this could be um, when you were explaining to the patient about their discharge instructions, I would have asked the patient to give me a teach back. So I understood what they said. <clears throat> you, or you could do that a little summative, like when you saw this patient um, when we admitted two patients, one patient with sickle cell and one patient with cholecystitis, um, I noted that uh, the IV fluids were continued for more than 24 hours. And it's important to review your orders at the end of every day to see what you need to renew and what can be stopped. So when completing that narrative template and our framework that I like to use, or we use at UT Southwestern, is what I call the PCA as, as, as a palliative <laughs> doctor. Um, so it's always commenting on professionalism, because these are important skills as a physician, communication, as well as clinical acumen. So we use this framework, the PCA, and our evaluations we'll talk about in professionalism, in communication, um, in clinical, with clinical acumen. And in professionalism, the domains we like to have all of our evaluators talk about are initiative, timely task completion, response to feedback, with communication, responding appropriately to patient emotions, identifying and aligning with patient values. And then we use the various EPAs for clinical acumen. And we're always asking for specific descriptions of the behaviors. We also use these conversations for a space for what I like to call humble inquiry. So when people use terms like confident, that's where I ask, tell me more. What did you, what do you mean by you wish the learner was more confident? What exactly did you see? What would you have wanted to do differently? And sometimes it takes a little bit of, of uh, working on like getting to it because we code it so quickly, like going back, going back to the experience um, to remember can be helpful and then avoiding those terms. So what about for letters? 
Um, so when thinking about a checklist for letters, we think about um, what to include and what to avoid. So we really need to work on a standardized letter format. I need to like I need to really work on my own personal letter of recommendations and ensuring that it's a, a standardized format, but we really should be having a standardized format for that. You want to describe that relationship and context with the applicant. You want it to be rooted in evidence, in evidence and making sure you're talking about competency related behavior and not just personal attributes. Um, you want to have equal application of ability, agentic and standout language an equal use in framing, that framing is really important, of communal language for all your evaluatees, especially if it relates to patient care. Um, and then the ranking of the evaluatee in the context of your career is important. I think we need to be careful and we need to look back at our own personal ranking, right? You need to have an, a good enough end, right, to be able to look but we do need to do that, right? We need to look back and be like, do I have any patterns here um, to make sure where there may be personal bias? Um, you want to avoid doubt raising, grindstone, primarily communal language, those non-specific generalizations. It's, I always find it fascinating when I write a letter and then I let some like APD or somebody read it and they tell me something, I'm like, oh my God, that's what you thought? <laughs> like, that's not what I meant. Because if it's non-specific, you have to root it in those observations. Um, really think about specific terms such as competent, especially for underrepresented in medicine applicants, because we have a lot of evidence of how it may be used and the use of the word confident. Descriptions of applicants' appearance really should be not put into a letter. And then be really cautious about including stories about applicants' personal background. Um, you should really think about why you're putting that into a letter and you should definitely have permission from the applicant if you are going to include it into a letter. Um, so there is, you know, AI is here, right? <laughs> Artificial intelligence. And it can be helpful. There was this uh, article that was written last year, um, but it's currently not integrative. Um, and so you have to like go put, it, put the, you know, your letter into other tools there are different tools out there and it also requires programming. And so you, if, you're, if you're programming it, you may be programming it with your own bias too. So we just have to be careful. It's not in its current state, it's not um, able to solve all of these problems, but maybe one day. I want you to take a screenshot of this if you don't already know it or don't already have it handy somewhere. Um, so these are the competency related descriptor examples that were given in that first paper by Rojek et al. Um, and so these are, these are uh, uh, really good words that can be used to describe competencies. We need to make sure we're backing it up with evidence. You're not just using the word, but you're also including concrete examples. And these are the personal attribute descriptor examples you can also take a screenshot of that we should really be trying to avoid. Um, although I have a hard time with re reliable is good. I like reliable. We all want reliability, right? <laughs> um, so, but making sure if you're using it, you're using it equally and you're backing it up again um, with evidence. So just being really careful and just really being more intentional, right? Just really looking at your own practice. So what about on a programmatic level? What about those structured evaluative letters? What has the evidence showed us there? Um, so the evidence has showed us that separating specific competencies or qualifications can help mitigate bias. Separating them out from personal characteristics section um, can be helpful to avoid a lot of those narrative bias. Focusing on criterion-based assessments, not normative, minimizing the quotes, and intentionally reviewing the use of doubt raisers, communal and grindstone qualifiers, and including a growth section for all letters. And we'll still need further study when we have all of these components in place to see, are we actually able to uh, eliminate bias? And there's a QR code if you wanna see the work that we have done for the internal medicine structured evaluative letter.
So programmatically, what's important? So implicit bias training, there is some evidence that it should, uh, there's, I guess it's controversial. Like, should it be uh, mandatory or should it not? There is some evidence that for some people, if you make it mandatory, they may start doubling down on their biases. So um, it, yes, I think more work needs to be done on that. Um, inclu ensuring inclusion of all competencies and non-cognitive qualities on all evaluations. When you're writing your evaluations, making sure your questions are behaviorally based. Creating spaces to slow down thinking, right? Like I think most of us, when we have a task, we check that task box and we're really ready to check it off and we just go through the motions, just all type one thinking. So creating those spaces, you're not just completing your evaluation quickly and that allow for humble inquiry. Making sure that these are committee decisions for high stakes advancements and grades, de-identifying evaluations before they're reviewed, utilizing structures and, and standard templates for program handoffs, and making sure that you're reviewing all of these outcomes through a DEI lens. Okay, so I got four minutes. I'm gonna show an example. So this is A, had solid clinical skills and gave nice presentations. They exceeded all of the best basic expectations, had a cheerful attitude, uplifted the team, was still never satisfied until they could find some way to improve. They had immediate responsiveness to feedback, but demonstrated both A's unique abilities as a professional, as a physician, and also A's humble grace as a learner. Definitely honors, right? A was reliable, respectful, pleasant, and mature. A hit a nice bedside manner with patients and connected with them with cultural understanding. So just want you all to think to yourselves, do these comments address professionalism, communication, and acumen? Yeah, so you can see a lot of personal qualities that are used, right? Humble, grace, reliable, respectful, mature, pleasant, cultural, cheerful. That's a non-specific, solid. Right, right? Sometimes solid is bad. Sometimes solid is good. Um, <laughs> nice, good, right? Like these are all like, huh, like what, what does that mean? Doubt raiser, the basic expectation, like, oh, like when you exceeded all of the basic, wow, what, what about the not basic expectations? <laughs> what about those, right? So that's a little bit of a doubt raising language. And then there are some competencies like responsiveness to feedback is important. Empathy is important, um, but not a lot of concrete examples, right? So not really sure. Like, I'm not really sure what the learner was doing. Like, I just think they they liked this, this supervisor, this assessor liked the student. There's a lot of likability going on, but I'm not really sure how the learner performed or what they're able to do. Um, here's also another one, um, but I'm actually gonna skip to this one. So this was, it was a pleasure teaching and working with C. C was always on time and fully ready for rounds. C exhibited excellent communication with the team patients and their family. I've observed them counsel patients expertly, sitting down or leaning down to patient's eye level, using plain language that was easy to understand and using silence to ensure that patient had chance to speak. C took true ownership of patients and patients looked to them as their main physician. Furthermore, C demonstrated evidence-based approach when making decisions to guide further diagnostic and therapeutic efforts. C had excellent differential diagnoses that always included those that cannot be missed. C responded very well to feedback and was able to give very helpful feedback regarding the rotation itself. So there's an equal amount of these female male associated terms. Um, sorry, it does address professionalism, communication, as well as clinical acumen, and with specific mention of what C did and C's behavior. So just some key takeaways. Um, so despite 
evidence of at least equal competency. Multiple studies have showed that evaluations and letters of recommendations for women and underrepresented in medicine are biased. You need to utilize a system of documenting those observations in real time to mitigate bias and intentionally apply and review letters for equal application of the agentic and communal language through the use of word list, online tools. We need to really focus on qualifications, not only qualities. Standard letters can mitigate, although they aren't going to fully eliminate some bias. And just as microbiology is local, bias is also local. So you really need to study your own program to find out where you need to improve. So I did want to acknowledge some people. Um, so Sarah, Dr. Sarah Baker, she's an Associate Dean for Student Affairs, the Department of Psychiatry at, at my institution. And she's wonderful and does a lot of work um, in this realm. And we um, have given this talk uh, together before. Also want to thank a lot of my colleagues from the Alliance of Academic Internal Medicine who do some amazing work in equity in the learning environment, um, as well as my colleagues um, that I got to work with in, for uh, the Internal Medicine Department of Medicine letter and Structured Evaluative Letter Task Force over the years, including um, the staff at AIM. And then I have to thank my family that keeps me sane. <laughs> These are my kids, um, Jonas and Anaya, and my husband, Jay. And just, yeah, I'm ready for questions and love to hear your thoughts. We have the opportunity now to engage with Dr. Abraham in questions. We have time set aside here, and I see we have one question from the audience, and then we'll turn to some of the online questions. Yes. Uh, we have another microphone for you. Hi, my name is Christine Sharkey. Um, I'm in rheumatology. Thank you for the talk today. Uh, my question's more, um, I liked how you presented about um, letters and that sort of thing, but um, my concerns are more when residents are here or fellows are here and more of um, your thoughts or is there studies or research more about um, bias about putting pay, uh, residents or fellows on probation, what that language looks like, um, gaslighting that happens in that sense, and how do we mitigate that? Yeah, I'm not sure if there is evidence on probation. I didn't look into that. I I worry about saying something <laughs> because I don't know the evidence, right? Um, and I don't want it to use it on um you know, based on bias, but I mean, definitely we know for standardized assessments that there are lower uh, uh, scores as well as um, there are narratives that are framed like with the doubt raising language and the minimal assurance. And so those things go into those committee decisions, right? So again, like when we're thinking about, I, I'm also on our student promotions committee um, at our university. And the, when we're trying to get data, like this is where you're getting the data from. And so if, if those scores are lower, um, as well as standardized test taking, which is a lot of how you either pass or fail some of these clinical learning environments um, that can uh, that can also appear. So I do worry that because based on the data, there's bias there that that it is going to affect those committee decisions. But um, I'm not sure of the evidence that exists right now, and there definitely needs to be more work that looks into it. Um, I mean, there's also a lot of great work. Um, looking into the feedback that's given. I know you guys are working on feedback with uh, residents and how you know that changes persona and how there's a lot of um, feedback. Um, and, and like, you know, either you're, you know, you're too quiet or you're too aggressive or you're too, so you have to fit this expectation that um, someone else has for you um, and how that can affect your performance because it is a very performative environment. Um, and so I think that's a little bit of the worry of how performative it is and then all of these other factors and expectations that are put upon it. So yeah, it's a really great thought. 
Wow, oh, it's working, okay. <laughs> and after you, we have one question online that we'll do and then we can turn it over to the audience again. Thank you so much, Dr. Abraham. I'm also a hospitalist and sometimes work with uh, preliminary applicants. Yeah. So people going into radiology or opto, that kind of thing. And sometimes I struggle to write a letter for those fields because I don't know exactly what those fields are looking for. Um, I'm wondering how you handle not matched specialty letters in your own work. And then also when the applicant is kind of more of a so-so person, mm -hmm. um, I tend to fall back on some of the language that was less desirable in those letters. So I'm just curious how you approach um, letters of rec for patient or for students that are a little bit more average. Yeah. And so it's, again, I try to, so being criterion referenced, as opposed to nor and it's always that's the hard part with the letter of recommendation and why I mean I personally need to do a lot of work on my personal or we'll say I've worked a lot on these big things I need to now like work on the the personal because um, to avoid those those language terms right and the doubt raising just try to be factual and I like I am a doctor I can speak in physical exam I can speak in objective terms like that's what I was trained to do so it's really training myself again to do the same same with these behaviors. So going back to the entrustable professional activities, going back to the milestone language and, and learning how to do that. That being said, okay, I will say my, my grace and mercy to the everyday faculty that does not have protected time to do this stuff is like, I, I think there needs to be some, um, you know, expertise that can help with that. Um, and tools, honestly, that can help with that too, is what we need to work towards. Um, and so, because I just don't think all faculty who are, you know, 100% taking beautiful care of patients and should be expected to be experts in assessment as well. It's just not fair. All right, we have one online question here, and then we'll go back to the audience. A study by a Stanford Medicine group published this week in PNAS showed a clear difference in the brain default mode network between men and women. How might this be playing into bias in our evaluations? Um, well, it's, yes, so I didn't read that study, so I'd love to hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I'd love to hear more. Um, I think there is a lot. Well, so first, yes, uh, there's like uh, biological, right. And there's also like, uh, you know, um, you know, how people present themselves. So I think, yes, I think there's spectrums too. Um, so I think it isn't, I do think some of this would be interested since I haven't read the study to be like, is this from early age or later age? Like how much of this is like conditioned versus not conditioned. So that's why it's hard for me, um, to know, because I think so much of our society is conditioned to, so it would be interesting to hear, was this like kids that also were, um, were, were trained to do this? Or is this a lot of our societal messages that, um, uh, that have affected that, that response or that reaction? Uh, there has been work done to uh, provide examples that, that are less gendered. Because a lot of times some of the examples we provide for people to, you know, un picture something are very gendered. And so there has been work to, uh, to look at that and like how we're providing examples and, and trying to eliminate our gendering of how things should be too. So, I mean, I do think that, I think it's a lot. I think it's biological, there are biological issues, there are societal issues, there are, you know, cultural, local cultural issues, there are personal issues. So, I mean, I, I think this work can go on for a long time to make it better. I just wanted to make one comment, uh, thinking about how you're talking about cultural issues. We all know we live in the world of Wisconsin nice here. <laughs> so I, it would be really interesting, I think, to study how our comments maybe mm -hmm. differ from yes. other parts of the country to not be named right now and in terms of how comments might look different. Mm -hmm. But the question I have is your structure of professionalism, mm -hmm. communication, and clinical acumen. Have you seen mm -hmm. that making differences in how people are writing comments? So we, what we have seen, we need to study the terminology, the narrative differences. I will say being in the state that I'm in, they don't always want us to look into these things right now. So that's, that is a challenge of where I am right now. I've actually 
been requesting for a little bit of time, but have, have uh, reached a wall, but I'm very um, persistent. So no worries. Uh, <laughs> so I'll just keep going at it. Um, but we have seen that there has been much more um, uh, rich comments and feedback and equal application of professionalism community, where we used to have evaluations that just spoke about professionalism or just spoke about communication. So we do have some equal application of the competencies now. So that was step one. And we have had actually, we, cause we, you know, we, we did a, a study because learners will say, I got no feedback. And so we actually looked at our, our evaluations. We're like, did you get no feedback? And then we're like, actually these EPAs are all commented on. And like this professional is all commented on. So we found that there is feedback happening, whether or not people are viewing it as valid is a different question. Um, or, you know, how they're internalizing the feedback is a different question. But we did find that there, we are giving a lot of feedback on these competencies. So, but we do need to look at our narrative language differences. Hi, thank you for so much for that fascinating and really very practical talk. Uh, my question is uh, having to do with the adjectives that are used in the letters. Is there gender concordance with the author and the student? Has that been looked into? Yes, there has. Yes, there's been a lot of a lot of looking at of uh, gender concordance. And the thing is, there's it's different. The the outcomes have been different, which is why I think you have to look locally to see, because there are like, you know, I, I learned about Wisconsin nice since I've been here. We, we call it Southern hospitality <laughs> where I'm from. Um, and so, you know, I, th I think there are so many different microcultures that may affect some of that. So, but there have been studies that looked at concordance and there are different results. Dr. Abraham, um, thanks so much for your talk today. So I had a quick question. So I'm doing a lot of work, as you know, near peer feedback evaluation. And one of the comments I'm seeing a lot is continue with oh, in areas of improvement. Yeah. And I'm yeah. wondering if that's like a local difference or if you've come yeah. into like that in your work in we evaluations. Do, definitely there is continue with. Um, that's interesting. So um yeah, because, well, and so I, I am vital talk uh, faculty certified trained, right? And so there is a lot of dis, um, importance in educational theory about reinforcing what is going well. So I, I think that is good feedback because in performative environments, we don't always have good insight because there's stress, right, that's happening. And so I do think that can be helpful. So I don't know. Um, and I know even business culture uses the continue, like some of the different ways of giving performance um, annual reviews is there's one called the stop, start, continue. That's like one way to give. I, that's how my husband used to get his reviews. <laughs> I know the, and I've looked in the business, so that's there. So I think continue can be helpful. Again, it should be equally applied. I think equal application is, is really important. Um, thank you for the talk. It was really practical. I love that. Um, this was a lot about written feedback. Can you make any comments about verbal feedback and real-time feedback and mitigating bias there? Yeah. Well, I know you guys are doing some great work here. I'm actually really excited to hear what you all are going to learn. Um, it's. I think it's very similar principles. I haven't looked deeply into the literature on it. Um, I think a lot of my a lot of my experience with that is honestly with communication training, right? Because a lot of it's all simulation training and a lot of uh, concepts from um, from simulation. Um, and so I think a, a framework is always important. So when you're doing simulation, you're debriefing in the very, very same ways each time. And so I think it's really, we have to be intentional with our frameworks. Um, and then also, uh, yeah, I mean, we do have some data with these qualitative studies about when people use terms like confident or they're giving, um, they're giving feedback, uh, how people may internalize that. So we do have to be careful with word choice. Um, uh, I think word choice is always hard because words change over time, like how they were used for me may not have the same meaning for other people. 
Um, so I think we, we have to learn. I think we have to continually learn and we have to continually try to get feedback on how things are being received. Um, and we talked about yesterday evening at dinner, how we need to make sure we're getting different types of feedback. So I think some feedback, you know, can be quali doing some qualitative studies to, to figure out even, um, you know, just round table discussions after rotations occur, like trying to create open conversation and inquiry, right? Um, being open, which is sometimes hard when you're stressed of so being open to that type of feedback too. But I do think there are differences. I think the same principles of using a framework when you're giving um, real-time feedback is important too. Yeah, here you go, all right, one, one more question in the back. And then what we'll do is we'll take a 10 minute break and then come back and have our award ceremony. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Sorry, hi, um, I'm with the, uh, the undergraduate medical education administrative team. And a lot of what we end up doing is uh, following up with faculty members about completing the yeah. evaluations that go into students' MSPEs. Everybody's laughing because now they recognize my face from my emails yeah. that I pester yeah. people yeah. with. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of the, so a question that I sort of have is like, how do you get buy-in from your faculty to spend the time to create these really comprehensive narrative feedback mm -hmm. portions, especially because most of the faculty that I work with do not have that built-in admin time to no, write no. these evaluations? Yeah, no, it's it's a lifelong journey. And it's, I mean, your administration, so I mean, we adopted this work from um, Dr. Pangaro's work in conversation um, theory, and then, you know, learning all about the theory behind it, and also thinking about mitigating bias. So I can't say that we have wonderful buy-in. Um, I, again, I'm very persistent. <laughs> um, and so it's been interesting to be doing it for, I want to say six years now. Um, and our other point of doing it was it's real time faculty development, right? Like, so like that's me spending one-on-one -on -one time with faculty talking about each of the EPAs. So the number of evaluation conversations that occur now are less than they were the, before. Um, and we find that people are still using the same framework, right? So that's been helpful. Um, so buy-in is difficult. We uh, use the LCME a lot, like we, you know, like the tyranny of the urgent and, and not being credited. So we say our feedback scores are terrible. Like your evaluation time is terrible, you know? So we use that as like the way to um, entice some people. We use personal relationships. So we have, so I am, um, you know, palliative care and I've also, um, in hospital medicine, we have one of our clerkship directors who's hospital medicine, and we have the other one who's a general internal medicine faculty. And we just like, we're like, hey, remember me, we're friends. Like, so we use personal relationship to also, well, basically we use any way we can. Um, we're, so right now our chair's bonus is tied to timeliness of evaluation. Um, which this is the first time that's happened in six years. So finally, and then he tied the division chiefs uh, bonuses to it too. And so um, all of a sudden this year, I've been doing this for years, right? And I've been been recording who's timely and who's not. And, and, and all of a sudden everybody cares. And I'm like, hi, I've been here six years. But again, being persistent, I'll keep doing the system and one day you will care. <laughs> I'm here to help you. So that has also really helped. So I think you have to do multiple levels. So personal relationships, um, systematic changes, you know, keeping on telling your um, department why it's important. I mean, we have data. So we're also doing a project to improve our narrative evaluations on the ambulatory clerkship. Um, and we're using the narrative evaluation quality index that was developed by the University of Rochester. Um, and that their study showed, right, that after 10 days, the NEQI scores went down. Um, and so the, they presented this at the clerkship director of internal medicine meeting last year. And, you know, their comment was like, unlike, unlike fine wine, <laughs> evaluations don't age well over time. And it makes sense. Your, you know, your retention is going to be less. Like you're not going to be able to put the details. You're not going to be able to comment on um, as many domains as you would have before. So we're also trying to give arm people with data 
Um, so that's our next, that's our next project is using this NEQI, trying to develop a module that's uh, asynchronous because we, we all don't have time or, or, or um, FTEs for all of this too, um, to see if it helps. So if that works, I will, we will gladly disseminate to see if that helps with timeliness as well as improving narrative evaluations. Thank you. Awesome presentation and thank you. Thank you.